I have the pride privilege to introduce to you the preacher for this morning, amen. amen. This preacher is generally low key in the background. This preacher is the reason why we have heard and been heard on every continent in the world. It is his ministry that's produced the Crossover Bible Fellowship app, website, all that faithful man of God, good friend and brother, in the training school of Reggie Holiday School of Preaching. <laughs> and so let me introduce you all to one of our brothers, Nathan Alote, amen. Nathan Alote. Nathan Alote. He's going to come and break the bread, amen. And so we're looking forward. It is the elders' deep commitment to uh, make sure that we are raising up a generation of transformed disciples that are not ready for the future but are ready right now. And so we want to thank God for the fact that these young men uh, are faithful, love the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, want to proclaim him and make his name known and great. And so I want to uh, also, if you'll be seated for just one second, just one second. Um, if Marshall McCartney, if you'll stand, Joseph Chin, you'll stand, Joaquin, stand, Eric Brown, Joe, uh, uh, Jermon, if y'all will stand. These are all, the, the, this is the first layer of group of men uh, that are going to be preaching the word of God. So you've heard from Jermon, you've heard from Joe, now you're going to hear from Nate. But these guys right here are in the training school of Reggie Holiday School of Preaching, amen. And so, uh, amen. And due to the financial peace nature of Reggie's home, it's a free course, so they don't have to pay anything, amen. Nathan Alote, come on and break this bread, amen. Amen, crossover. Amen, it is a joy to be with you all this morning. That, uh, that training school is pretty real. But I, I do thank the holidays for their hospitality when we go through that training school. Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord today with you all. And just to, um, just to make sure I cover this, I just want to make sure to thank uh, Pastor Blake. Thank you for the opportunity just to stand before the people. Uh, I know I do not take that lightly. Um, this is a holy, honored space. Thank you to all the elders as well, um, how you serve us. And all of you who serve here in leadership, even as you're a member, uh, you're serving as well. So. Just thank you for the opportunity to stand before you today. Well, we will be in Acts chapter 16, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 5 in Acts chapter 16. And as you turn there, uh, just a quick background. Over the last eight weeks, we've been in a series called 180 Radical Change. See it on the screen. Um, it's been a radical life change of the Apostle Paul. But really, the series has been about us. How has God been changing us, working on us? The first couple of messages, we looked at our perspective, how we were lost, now we're found, we were blind, now we see. Then we move forward to our pursuits. What were we pursuing? What were we chasing after? It looks different when you experience a 180. And then finally, more recently, we've been talking about purpose. What is our purpose now that we've been flipped around and set on a certain course? Uh, it shouldn't look like our old purpose. But what does it look like now? So that brings us to where we are today in Acts 16 and looking at verses 1 through 5. I was going to say if you all would stand, but you all know you're already standing, so thank you. Uh, let's go. Uh, Acts 16, verses 1 through 5. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts. For they all knew his father was a Greek. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Uh, let us pray. Uh, Father God, just thank you once again, Lord, for this uh, time and this opportunity. I think it's absolutely amazing 
that in eternity past, you knew we would be here today. So there's so much purpose that's even happening today, Father God. So I just pray, Lord, you would open our minds and our hearts to receive the word. Uh, Lord God, let it, let it not just stop here. Let us receive the word, internalize it, and then make sure to spread it to others, Father God, because that's also a part of um, how you set us on our 180, Father God. I just pray and ask, Lord, that you would uh, increase and I would decrease, hide me behind your cross, Lord God, so that um, we all can get a message that you purpose for us to hear on this specific day, Lord God. Uh, so just thank you once again, Lord God. Um, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be holy and acceptable to you. And uh, just thank you, Lord God. If nothing else, you've already done enough. So we thank you, Lord, and give you the glory, uh, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Uh, you may be seated, and as I mentioned, we're in the series 180, so for the short time that we have together, we are going to be looking at uh, purposeful discipleship, Acts 16, 1 through 5, purposeful discipleship. And just to, just to kick things off, uh, if you don't know, uh, I'm a very animated storyteller, so I'm, I'm going to try to stay in this box here, uh, but yeah, so it starts with a story. So I was in college, right, I was in college at Baylor University. And the first couple of years, I didn't have a car, you know, so I had to get a ride different places. And I remember being at a church event and, you know, brother said, yeah, you need a ride? I'm like, you know, I do. So we get in the car and we're driving and he turns to me and he's like, you know, Nathan, he turns down the music. I'm like, man, what you doing? Turn down the music. He's like, Nathan, let me ask you a question. Uh, do you know what discipleship is? So I looked at him with a smirk on my face and I was like, let me pass your little Christian pop quiz. Uh, yes, I know what discipleship is. I answered his question. Then he asked me another question. He said, are you being discipled? Now, I had to think about it because I wasn't sure what he was talking about. I didn't know if he was talking about my affiliation to Jesus, because technically we are disciples of Jesus. So I didn't know what he was talking about. I'm, I was thinking to myself, well, I chose Baylor. I got into every school I wanted to and I applied to, and I chose Baylor because it's a Christian school. I go to church, I read my Bible, I go to Bible study, uh, I try to avoid sin. So am I a disciple? Technically, yeah. And he's like, that's not exactly what I mean. I mean, are you in a relationship with someone on a one-on-one -on -one basis, walking through life, walking through certain issues, talking, talking about things that are uncomfortable, revealing? And as he's talking, I'm thinking, mm, no, not really. I'm, I'm not that. I haven't had that yet. Not really. He said, okay. Well, I just wanted to let you know uh, and, and invite you for the opportunity. You know, I'm, I'd be willing to disciple you. You know, we can meet, you know, once a week. We can walk through certain issues. We can talk about things. And as he's talking, I'm not, I'm not really listening because I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> oh, so you think you're Jesus. <laughs> so you think you're Jesus. So, so you Jesus, I'm the disciples. I'm the disciples fumbling, bumbling after you. That's what I was thinking. This is literally what came to mind. Now, I know you all don't know who that is so, uh, because you listen to too much Fred Hammond, so let me explain. Um, this is uh, Christopher Wallace, a.k.a. The Notorious B.I.G. So in my mind, I'm thinking, you want to be Biggie, you want me to be puffy in the background, <laughs> dancing. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not really feeling that. I'm not really feeling that, you know. And, and for th those who are more, a little more seasoned, uh, you know, another example is... I was thinking, okay, you want to be Michael, you want me to be Tito? You want to be Michael, you want me to be Randy? See, some people are like, Randy, who's that? Exactly. Uh, and then the last thing that came to my mind was, <laughs> you want to be Batman, you want me to be Robin, you want me to be your sidekick. Not really feeling that. And I started having thoughts of, you know, traveling with him to like a revival and, you know, getting the room temperature bottle water ready for the men of God and, and, and like, you know, and he, would, and he would be speaking at a revival and he takes off his jacket and he throws it and I just catch, catch it and put it on a hanger and hold it for him. And, and when it's time to do offering, I would guard the money for him and I would count it. You know, just thoughts like that came into my mind uh, when the invitation of discipleship went out. But in, in all honesty, even though I had those assumptions, when we talk about biblical discipleship, all of the thoughts and imaginations that I had, none of that is true. There's an element of it, yes, there's an element of serving somebody and being beside them, but all the other things I was worried about, mm, that's not really true. So today, as we look at the text, we're going to look at uh, four things. 
uh, for purposeful discipleship. That is the desire of discipleship, the investment of discipleship, the cost of discipleship, and the results of discipleship. So just again, uh, Acts 16, 1 through 5, there's an important thing on how this text intros, and I'll read it again, the first part of verse 1. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and there was a disciple there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was Greek. So pausing right there, there's a little bit of background. So, uh, and if you can give me the next slide, uh, there's a little bit of background. So Paul went on a first missionary journey, and as he traveled on the first missionary journey, this is an example of that. He went on his first missionary journey, and he went up to Antioch, then, which is further to the north, and went down to Iconium. And they were doing a couple, preaching the gospel, and people were getting changed, 180, and they were getting saved. However, two things happened. Some people believed on this side and said, man, I didn't know. I, I have to get with, I got to get with this Jesus. The other half said, no, we don't like that. We want to keep living how we're living, and we're going to kick you up out of here. So they tried to grab and stone the disciples and those who were preaching, but they couldn't get to them. So they went to another city. They went to uh, Lystra and the Derby, and they're doing the same thing, preaching the gospel, people turning. Oh, man, I didn't know about Jesus. All right, gotcha. I got you. I'm following that. However, the people were so angry in those other cities, they followed them all the way down to these other cities. Sounds a little familiar to Paul's previous background, but they follow him all the way down to these other cities, and they finally you know, get a hold of Paul at this case, and something happens to him. So really quick, if you would turn, just for some background, if you would turn to um, Acts 14, verse 19. Acts 14, verse 19. And as I mentioned, they followed him all the way to this area, and this is what happened to him. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, having won over the crowd, they convinced other people. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. So in other words, they were so upset, they chased him down, got a hold of him, stoned him, and suppose they thought he was dead. The verse right after that, but... But when the, while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city, and the next day he went away with Barnabas to Derby. So after getting stoned, he got up and said, I still have a mission to do. And he still went forward. So that was that. That was one trial. But there was another issue that popped up, and this is still background. There's another issue that popped up. They were arguing over whether or not the Gentiles, that's anybody that's not a Jew, the Gentiles, whether or not they needed to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. They were arguing about it. And just a quick sidebar. So in other words, all that's required is belief in the gospel in terms of salvation. But be careful. Anytime somebody adds the word and to belief in the gospel, you're about to be introduced to some legalism or something that's going to have you in bondage, to Je bondage and not really following Jesus for the rest of your life. Now for them, they're talking about circumcision. For us, it'd be make sure you wear the right clothes. Uh, you can't go there no more. Uh, I know you at the grocery store, you know, the, the spirit's aisle, just walk the other way. Don't even walk over there. You have to do that to stay saved, if you will. Anytime somebody puts an and on belief in the gospel, you can tune that out. But they're arguing about this, and it's so important. It goes up to all the apostles, and they're meeting and talking about this, and they say, look, the only, when you believe in the gospel, that is it. It is grace through faith. Grace through faith. Nobody deserves to be saved. It is all grace. And that was the answer that they specifically had when came down. So Paul is thinking, okay, I have to go back to this same region to let people know what is going on. Because we can't have this rumor spreading around that people need to do something to impress God. Because besides belief, you can't do anything else to impress God. Now, obedience, but that's only after you have submitted yourself to his will, right? So we're talking about a couple different things. So it was so important. Paul's like, you know what? I have to go back there to share the gospel. And that brings us to our first point, if you can change the slide. A 180 occurs when your desire to see people's lives change outweigh your fear of discomfort. Your fear of discomfort. There's such a strong desire. And I shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to tell it really quick. Um, 
when I was younger, there was a young lady I had my eye on, and you know, I really wanted to impress her, if you will, and um, you know, she gave me an invitation to come over, you know, just to talk. Uh, you know, so um, I was younger and I didn't have a car. I mentioned that earlier. I was younger and I didn't have a car. So I was like, man, this is kind of far, like, you know, almost 10 miles away. Better start walking. So I'm walking all the way there and <laughs> I'm walking all the way there and to my surprise and dismay, um, a Doberman comes and looks at me. We, we pause and look at each other at the same time, just. And he starts running at me, trying to, so I'm running from the dog, and I'm like, thank God, a fence. I jump, this is a true story, jump the fence, and I'm like, ah, oh, thank God. There's a dog in the next backyard. <laughs> and then the dog that was chasing me is coming over the fence. I'm like, man, come on, and I'm running, I'm running. I think the people see me through the window, they just lock it, and, and I'm just like, man. <sighs> but I was trying to get to a certain place because I had a strong desire to be there, and I didn't care what I had to go through. So, now here's the thing though, here's the thing. I didn't even get any reward that day. So, so nothing happened and I went through that for nothing. But, see, but that was me chasing some, that was the wrong 180, but after being changed by 180, how much more should we as believers have a desire to go get other people, see I was doing that for my benefit, but how much more should we as believers have a desire to go get other people so that their lives can be changed. It cannot stop at what we want. We have to have a strong desire, and Paul had that. So again, now it's a little different when you read, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra, and there was a disciple there. So they preached the gospel earlier, from Christians to disciples. I have to go back to make sure they're disciples, and nothing happens to them, and they get the actual right word that they need. So that's the thing. So again, um, as we continue, one application point just to think about is there's a risk when you return to the same places God called you out of. Amen. Now, so, so with that, sometimes that is emotional. Maybe you have to go back to a place you really don't want to. Uh, sometimes that's actually physically. I brought up college. Thank God I had a decent college career. Uh, but there were some people who uh, encounter me in the future, and they're like, man, I'm glad you didn't go with us that night, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm glad I didn't either, otherwise you wouldn't listen to what I'm about to tell you about Jesus. <laughs> you would be uh, questioning me um, about that. But again, so if you have a strong desire, one of the reasons Paul also uh, had a strong desire to go back in that region is because he knew he had been invested in. He knew that he, when he came to belief, it wasn't on his own, that a lot of things transpired and happened just for him to believe. So he had to understand the investment of discipleship and what happened with him. So looking at verses 1 and 2, we can see a little bit of the investment. Paul came down to Derby and Lystra, and there was a disciple there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were Lystra and Iconium. So he had a strong desire to go because he knew what he had been invested in. But just as is commentated here, Timothy also had... A big investment. So it was, it was an investment on both sides. Paul recognized that Jesus died for me, but he's not the only one who died for me. You know, in Acts chapter 7, there's a brother named Stephen, and he's preaching and talking and delivering the gospel like he's supposed to, and, and he gets stoned and killed, right? And if you can give me the next slide, he gets stoned and killed, and when he gets stoned and killed, and I have this up on the screen just as a picture. This is an example of the stones they use. This is not the rocks that are next to them. Whenever there's a stoning, they go to Rocks or Us and they say, hey man, I need a rock. Um, and they say, oh man, here you go. No, 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 no. There's a stoning today. Oh, I'm sorry. Here you go. And they give them the rock and they walk. So in other words, you're not, you're not supposed to make it past the stoning. That's supposed to be it for you. So. Paul understands what's been invested to him because as Stephen was preaching, proclaiming the gospel like he's supposed to, he gets stoned and killed. And Paul is watching, approving of it, thinking of, how come we're killing this guy and he's praising God as we are killing him? Yeah. This is ridiculous. He's like, whatever. They don't know what they're talking about. 
See, but now Paul understands what it means to be in the presence of God, because when you're in the presence of God, so all these other things, all these other threats, they don't really bother you so much. And even if you do, if they do bother you, you know it's a pleasure to serve God because being with God is all that really matters. So again, as Stephen was dying, he was worshiping God. Now Paul, who gets stoned, realizes I did not die because he set many, up pe many, many people up to die in that fashion. He said, I did not die. I have to go. Not only did Jesus die for me, Stephen died for me. There are other people who did what they could, even the disciples in teaching him. They invested a lot into him. So he's like, I have to go back. My desire has to be strong. Too much has been invested in me. Timothy recognizes this as well. Timothy has a different story, right? Timothy was the son of a Jewish woman, and his father was a Greek, which means something like this. Father, uh, you're talking about, uh, what, the God of Israel? What, he made this, this see in the land? I ain't really hearing that. Talk to me about Zeus or something. I ain't really feeling that. Nah, you know, y'all doing all this worship, I'm not really feeling that. So as he was growing up, he didn't have a father to guide him, to lead him, to teach him. He didn't have a father. But even though his father wasn't guiding him in the word, he still, God still purposed it that his mother and his grandmother would teach him. So on that, let's turn to 2 Timothy and we're going to look at verses uh, 1, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 5. This is the investment of discipleship. We're in this room today, not on our own accord, right? We're here because other people prayed. We came to know God because other people prayed for us, other people fasted for us, other people, when we're sleeping, they were awake praying for us. This can even be five generations ago. I'm not even talking about anyone we even know today. Some of us are here on the prayers of a grandmother or a great-grandmother, right? So again, um, as we're here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, For I am mindful of the sincere faith in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, and also in your mother Eunice, and I'm sure it is in you as well. So even though the father wasn't on his job in terms of teaching the son the scriptures and bringing him up because he's Greek, I don't really get down like that. God still used a mother and a grandmother to instill something specific in Timothy. And the great thing about that is now that his life has experienced a 180, and Paul can relate. He's the son of a Pharisee. He has a similar background. But now that their lives have both experienced a 180, they can use their past for their purpose. If you can give me the next slide. They can use their past for their purpose. So again, the investment of discipleship is a 180 occurs when you gain an appreciation for what ha God has invested in your salvation and discipleship. God's done a lot of work to get some of us saved. A lot of work. Uh, and I'm just happy that, and I'm blessed that, uh, his finished work on the cross was enough for all of us. From the person who lied on their taxes to the person who tried to rob a bank. To the person that said, Hey, man, I love her. Just one night to the person that just said, however many I want to love. Right? Love. However many I want to love. It, his grace was enough for all of us in his finished work on the cross. That's an investment. Something's been invested in us. And it can't just be, Lord, thank you, I'm a Christian. I'm going to stay in my comfort zone. I'm not going to represent you. It has to be more than that because too much has been invested in all of us. So as it pertains to Timothy, he recognized that as well, that regardless of what happened, God brought me to this point. And just as a quick sidebar, whether you have an absentee father or an absentee mother or whatever it may be, your heavenly father is there for you at all times. And he can make sure you learn exactly what you need to know, whether they're on their job or not. However, if you are a father and a mother and you are present, this also speaks to you as a way to, if you instill things in your children, God can make use of it in the future. Now, really quick, um, you know, my brother over here, you know, Joaquin Morris uh, and uh, Carlos Willis is another one. And Cedric Sykes is another one. They said, hey, man, let's go to this conference in Philadelphia. And I'm like, cool, I'm down to go. And now their, their travel plans confused me. I said, I want to do a direct flight from Houston to Philadelphia. That is it. I fly direct. 
I know how much my time is worth. I've calculated it. Nah, man, this should be only be about maybe three hours. It shouldn't be more than that. But they put together a plan to say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to fly to Baltimore, and then we're going to go through Delaware. And I'm like, Delaware? All I know about Delaware is that's where I send my student loan check. I don't know what you're talking about. So we're going through, like, Delaware, and we're going to go through these tolls, and, man, we'll get to Philadelphia. I'm like, man, come on, man. I'm like, all right, man, what we flying? Uh, well, we're going to fly Spirit. I'm, <laughs> I apologize, Spirit. Spirit, Spirit charge you for everything. You said, excuse me, I need to use the bathroom, $30. Never mind, sit down, forget it. I'll just hold it, forget it. But we, so we flew Spirit. So I was already mad we're flying Spirit, don't like Spirit, they charged me for everything. We're sitting on a plane, and um, my seat is assigned between two ladies. And I'm like, man, I'm in the middle, man, come on, man, I've been working now, I can't, I need some more room. So I'm sitting there, and there's a sister to my right, and another lady to my left, uh, of a lighter hue, another lady to my left, and you know, we're just talking, introducing things. And the sister to my right was confused about some things. She mentioned, well, the Bible says some things, but what about, the Quran says some good things too. And they're talking about it, and I'm sitting here thinking, just letting her talk like, man, Lord, give me the words to say. And, 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 and the lady to my left speaks up and she goes, the Quran doesn't say that. A little bit of background on her, as I found out, she grew up in Sudan. And when growing up in Sudan, they're going to make sure you know what the Quran is. This is northern Africa we're talking about. So you, they're ascribed to that religion more widely in that country. So she was taught all these things, but her family was impacted by Jesus, and they know what the gospel is. So now we're sitting on the plane. You would think that past is worthless. That past is not useful. What is it? What does learning that have to do with Christianity and the Bible and, and making disciples? That has nothing to do with it. Here is God using her past right now in her present for some purpose, right? So she learned all of that maybe for that flight and that interaction right there. Not to mention, some of us, we have a past as well. Uh, some of the past, it may not be learning the Quran, right? It's something else. But our past, whether it be marred by sin, things we don't want to talk about, want to share, because here we are in a building, and we don't want people to think less of us, God can use your past in your present for your purpose. So that means when it, when it comes to the investment of discipleship and understanding where we are, that means you might have to share some things you don't want to share in the discipleship process, because too much has been invested in you. You have to tell somebody. When, when it comes to discipleship, you're going to have to tell someone about the previous drug addiction you had, because they might be struggling with that today. You're going to have to tell some people that this is not my first wife. This is like my fifth. You're going to have to tell some people that those uncomfortable things that you don't want to deal with because they might be going through the same thing. And God wants to use that for your purpose. But if you're quiet, how are you contributing to the discipleship process, right? But again, so I don't know what that is for everybody. It's different, but there still is a cost of discipleship. So I don't know what that cost is. It might be going to an emotionally you know, place that you're not really comfortable sharing. It might be traveling somewhere. It might be, I don't know what it is. It's different for all of us as God has purposed in our lives. However, there is a cost to discipleship. If you give me the next slide. There is a cost to discipleship. This is just an example of a plane that is supposed to be nice. Uh, it's not spirit. I just, just, wanted to point, just wanted to reiterate that point to my brothers in which we flew. It's not cool. Next slide. Just wanted to put that in. So the cost of discipleship, that's how the plane should have looked. But anyway... Um, but anyway, so again, there is a cost to discipleship, and a 180 occurs when the gospel has so impacted your life, you're willing to sacrifice freedoms so another person can get to know God better. And in our main text, as we're there, I mentioned Timothy understood what's been invested in him. I had a mother, I had a praying grandmother, they taught me some things, but once I got hooked up to Jesus, all those things made more sense and I had a greater appreciation for my salvation. So in verse 3, Paul wanted this man to go with him. And he took him and circumcised him because the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew his father was a Greek. So his father had a reputation. So they all knew, Timothy, his father's Greek. 
He had a reputation, but known for the wrong thing. Be careful when you have a reputation and that reputation is not Jesus. May, may hurt your witness a little bit. And Paul's seeing this. He's like, his father has a reputation. Timothy is well spoken of, but I don't want that to hinder the gospel message. And I want him to go with me. I have an affection for him. I have to take this young man because Stephen was a young man of good reputation and I helped him get killed. But I have a 180 now. Here's another young man of good reputation that now I'm not going to destroy him. I'm going to help build him up. I want him to go with me. However, as, we, as I just mentioned earlier, in the chapter prior, they're arguing about circumcision. Is it, is it required for the... They're arguing about it. Paul is thinking, I know how I was. I, would, I wouldn't listen to that, especially if you're not circumcised. I'm not even hearing you. So, Timothy, you might have to do something and lay down one of your freedoms willingly, because you don't have to do this, but you might have to lay it down so somebody else can hear the word more clearly. Right? And I like how Crawford Loris puts it, if you give me the next slide. He, he says, Discipleship means I will represent my God and my Savior no matter what type of price I have to pay. As I mentioned, that looks different for different people. Uh, <laughs> Harold Washington, uh, <laughs> he, he always says this. It makes me laugh. He goes, uh, Nate, Doc, <laughs> you know how much it costs to make a disciple, Doc? I'm like, uh, no. Uh, doc, $12,861, Doc, 12 cents. That's how much it costs to make a disciple, Doc. And what he's highlighting is there is a cost. And that looks different for some people. And in his case, he's like, it hits me in my wallet. It hits me in my wallet. One time... Uh, I had a Mitsubishi Galant. That thing broke down all the time. It broke down so much, I would drive, and I hear a noise, and I'm like, I know what that is. It's, it's the carburetor. I know what that is. It's transmission. I know what that is. It broke down so much, I became an expert. I just knew what it was. I go to the mechanic and say, it's this. He's like, we need to check it. I'm like, check it. It's exactly what you said. I know, because it breaks down all the time. And it broke down, and I was between paychecks, and thank God, uh, Pastor Watt said, here you go. And I was like, really? Okay. I had to hold it up to the light, make sure it's real. Um, and, and, and I used that money to fix my car, and I was back on my way. So anything he wanted to say about Jesus, I was all ears. What do you have to say? What do you have to say? Now later, uh, you know, Pastor Wash would say, uh, I, you know, I paid him back. And later on he was like, oh, Doc, you don't have to pay me back. That's discipleship. And I was like, well, give my money back then. <laughs> That's okay, it's for the kingdom, amen. So, uh, again, even in that example, he knows it's going to hit me in my wallet. It's going to hit me in my wallet. Many of us have a rainy day fund, a vacation fund. Got to pay the rent, got to pay the mortgage. You know, this is, this is going to be entertainment fund. We got to watch Black Panther again. You know, we have all these things that we have. However, and do not raise your hand, how many of us have a discipleship fund? How many of us have a fun to say this is for discipleship because I'm going to have to use it in the process of making disciples? But like I mentioned, the cost looks different as God has purposed it for you. It may not be that specifically for you. As I mentioned, it may be comfort zone. Where do you need to travel? This entire month we've been going through mission classes and they've been teaching about missions. Maybe your cost is you have to get out your comfort zone and leave somewhere. I was talking to a brother uh, this week, and he said, you know, I had the opportunity to make double what I'm making now, but that means I would miss all of church and being with other people. So you know what? I'm going to keep this job where I'm making half of what I really want. The cost looks different. But when we're looking in the text, their, their lives are on the line. Now, I don't like to compare because, you know, we all have our own walk we're supposed to do. We all have our own cross we're supposed to bear, so I don't want to compare, really. However, their lives were on the line. This is life and death. For some of us, it's not life and death. It's comfort or cotton candy Christianity. And cotton candy Christianity is what I would say, you have to be careful of it, because it's the thing of enjoying the sweet things, well, the things that you deem sweet, but there's really no substance. 
Cotton candy Christianity is that Christianity where you say, you're not going to have to go through anything. Just love God. He'll take care of you. You'll have no worries. You'll have no pain. You'll have no strife. Jesus paid it all. You'll have, you know, there's a, there's a debt canceling anointing. There's a student loan canceling anointing. I'm like, it's very specific. I'm like, student loan? How come it's always a debt canceling anointing, right? Any anointing is to keep you faithful to your wife? They don't, any, any, any anointing to go forward for discipleship? Is, is, is there any anointing to say that I'm going to be faithful day by day, and when you look back, I've been faithful? Is there an anointing for that? So again, cotton candy Christianity is, again, and if you think about cotton candy, it looks big, it looks like a lot, but as soon as you bite into it, it's sweet, but it has no substance or nutritional value. Right? So again, cotton candy Christianity, it's sweet. It, it feels like easy street. You don't have to do much. But when life comes and hits you and something happens, there's no substance for you to really rely on because you haven't built up a root. So that's a warning. When we talk about the cost of discipleship, Cotton candy Christianity is something to avoid. How is it that you're not going to have any worries or any pain when really we see what Jesus went through? And some people won't become a disciple until some type of discomfort or pain happens. Because somebody may have to give their life, and in Jesus' case he did, for someone to believe. And even in the text we're looking at, Stephen gave his life, but it led to Paul's belief. So that's what they're faced with here. It's, Timothy, I know you don't need to be circumcised, but there's a cost, but, it, but there will be a result from what you're doing. It's not in vain. There's a result. And if you give me the next slide. A 180 occurs when God uses you to build up the body of Christ and you take someone along. So there's a result of the cost. You have to have a strong desire because you recognize what you've been invested in, but also even though there's a cost and it's different for all of us in the room, there's some results of that. Now let's look at verses 4 and 5 of Acts 16. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and they were increasing in number daily. Again, the result is of discipleship. The whole point is as they traveled along, the church would be made stronger. So really think about this. There was a lot of work put in for us to be in this room. There was a lot of work put in by others and a lot of prayers put in by others and a lot of lives sacrificed so that we can come to know who God is. But what has God called us to? Is it cotton candy Christianity? And here's a hint. At Crossover on the back wall, there's a specific quote on what God has called us to. We always talk about, you know, Jesus died for you, so live for him. Have you heard that before? Jesus did more than that. Jesus died, was buried, and was raised. But after he was raised, he said something. And he said, go make disciples. Because this is what I've laid out to help you strengthen the church and even strengthen your life. I think about going to the gym and those who go to the gym. Most people uh, do not go to the gym for a couple of reasons. One, pain. The second thing is, <laughs> yeah, because, yeah. When you get back into it, it hurts. One, pain. But the second thing is, I don't want to, I'm embarrassed. I don't want anyone to see me looking weak. But the smart people in the gym know I can just ask for a spot. And if I can't carry any weight, they'll help me lift it up. And this is true even psychologically. When you work out by yourself, you will not lift as much as you can. Because in your mind, you know I have to be careful in case it's too heavy. But when you're lifting with someone else, you'll pick up the whole thing more than what you thought you could because somebody else is there. Right? So again, as we talk about the results of discipleship, when you take someone along, that's to build them up, but that's also to build you up. And if you give me the next slide... So again, the results of discipleship. If you're not strengthening the church, then you may not be a disciple, or you may not yet be a part of the church. 
And I'm not talking about a church like this building. I'm talking about the church, the ecclesia, those called out by God for a specific purpose. And that purpose includes discipleship. Next slide. Earlier I mentioned uh, Batman and Robin. I said, <laughs> you want to be Michael, you want to be Tito, uh, you want to be Batman, I'm not trying to be your Robin. I'm not trying to be your sidekick. But some people don't know some things about Batman and Robin, so, so let me commentate a little bit. Batman's parents were millionaires. They worked very hard and built up a multi-million dollar fortune. And they were trying to get rid of crime in their city politically, but their lives were taken from them. And Batman, who is Bruce Wayne, sees the whole thing. So he witnesses his parents' death. They die unjustly before him. This, in, this gravely impacts him, and he says, you know what? I'm going to do something about it. He inherits his for the fortune from his family, the multi-million dollars. It's all his, and he inherits it, right? So he says, I'm going to do whatever I can to use what's been invested to save as many people as I can, right? So as he's doing this, he sees a young man whose parents died in front of him in a similar fashion his parents died. So he said, you know what? I'm going to adopt him because my past can relate to him. So when he adopts him, he says, you know what? Not only am I adopting him, see most people don't know this about Robin. Now, when he adopted him, he said, I'm not only going to adopt him, I'm going to sign some paperwork to say, my fortune will be yours. And he teaches Robin everything that he knows. And Batman goes to the Justice League, but Robin goes to the Teen Titans and leads up different teams to save people. So now more people are getting saved because of their relationship. Now, this is a story about, this is a fictional story. This is a comic book story. This is not real. But if you think about it, it is real. Because we have a heavenly father who had all riches, who had all glory, right? And he died, was, he, didn't, he didn't stay dead. He died, he was buried, and he was resurrected. And he said, now you all have all that I've given you my inheritance when you believe in me. And I am going to teach you how to save as many people as you can. But that process only happens when we're becoming more like Jesus through discipleship. So again, uh, as the question was posed to me, this is really a question that can be thought about internally for everybody in the room. Are you being discipled? I don't mean discipled like, what's my affiliation to God? Like I said in the beginning, Discipleship as we lay it out here, where there's a desire to see somebody change, where you invest in somebody, it, it might cost you something, but there's a great result. So let's pray. Father God, just thank you once again, Lord, for this time that we have, uh, Lord God. Just thank you just for allowing me to speak the word, Lord God, the words of life, Father. Um, not only that, but um, help us to all recognize what areas do we need help in? Sure, we can pray. Sure, we can.